1994, Eugene Debs was was pretty much at the helm of the Pullman strikes, the Pullman Railroad Company strikes. Now, what we need to understand in terms of the uh, Pullman strikes is uh, in the south side of Chicago, uh, which currently the south side of Chicago is is um, a notor- notoriously uh, low income part of Chicago. Uh, I've been through it and I've met some very nice people, but you know, the, the lesson that, uh, that they take to, they, they told me was you're here during the daytime. Things kind of change when the sun sets. It's like, all right, fair enough. Um, you know, but this was in the South side of Chicago and, and the, the people that were working for the Pullman railroad company lived in residential areas that were owned and controlled by Pullman himself. Uh, so this guy not only owned the railroad company, not only had a bunch of employees, but he had those employees living and paying rent in an area that that he owned. So he was kind of cashing out regardless, right? So, so all the money that he would um, pay out to his employees, he would essentially get a portion of that back by 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 rent of the buildings that he owned, that he made them live in, that they all had to live in. They, they had to live in these residential communities if you work for the Pullman Railroad Company, right? So all of a sudden, the rents start going up and the wages start going down. So this dude is cashing out double time here. He's decreasing wages that these people are making and he's increasing the rents. So he's getting double the fucking money. And every and people were just like, this is legal. That's That's exactly what needs to be done. You know, he's got... He's got a lot on his plate, okay? He's making more trains. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you when you make more trains, you got a lot of ground to break. You got to buy more shovels. What do you think? Those shovels are just coming out of nowhere. You got to pay for those shovels, okay? If, if he was allowed to just own the shovel company, this would be a different issue because then he could just uh, make one of his employees from the railroad company buy a shovel from his shoveling company uh, you know, and boom, biggity, biggity, boom. We're we're not paying that much for uh, for troubles. We improved that bottom line. That's just called business. Okay, that's just called being a genius. That's just called what you gotta do to be a good fucking American. Okay, everybody else, you're lazy. If you're not cheating the worker, you're fucking lazy. That's what you are. So, uh, reds go up, wages go down. People are getting upset. I mean, wouldn't you get upset, right? Like, if your rent went up, but the, the your landlord also owns the place that you work, and your rent has just gone up, and they're like, hey, we're slashing your pay. You wouldn't be upset? Come on. So at this point, um, Eugene Debs in 1893 had founded uh, one of the first uh, national industrial unions at that time. A uh, national industrial union called the American Railway Union, the ARU. And 35% of the Pullman workers were members of the ARU. Now, this is, again, it's a fairly new labor union that uh that Debs had founded, right? And they were still they were still kind of getting getting going. They were still getting memberships. They had a bunch of members from these other railroad companies and um you know, a, and a lot of the people that were um that were part of the ARU were what what they called unskilled workers, right? Uh they weren't like the engineers or the brakemen and um they were the people you know, that worked in the factories, essentially, that did, that, that kind of did some of the, the grunt work, so to speak. So Debs in the ARU went to bat for these workers, saying, hey, what you're doing isn't right. You can't be raising rents on property that you own and force your workers to live there and then also pay them less. That's crazy. Um, and uh, the Pullman Company was basically like, uh, you're not real, so we don't have to listen to you, so you can go fuck yourself. Uh, and, you know, 
my my response to that would have immediately been if you can touch me i'm real and this is a legitimate thing these are members of the union we're a real union and they're like nah you're not and uh the pullman company had its own representative it was the general managers association now the general managers association is uh, basically um who all the karens want to see when they say go get me a manager they're actually talking about people from the General Managers Association who uh, are not on the side of the worker. So, you know, I don't think this should come as a surprise to anybody. But uh, uh, the the Karens at large are not pro-worker. Go figure. You know, if there's anybody surprised by that, uh, I'm so sorry. Holy shit. How did you not figure that out? Did r- really the person that looks at a waiter and bitches at them and yells and complains at them is is not on their on the side of the working class american holy shit go figure right <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> what a surprise um so pullman company and the general managers association basically look at the aru and debs and they go you're not we're not going to listen to you because we don't have to you have no authority over us okay you don't you don't own us bro we own you we own you that's how this works, dog. That's basically the attitude that they had. So, uh, June 26th, 1894, 125,000 workers walked off the job. There's a wildcat strike. 125,000 just fucking out. We're done. We don't care. We don't, we're, we're not doing this shit anymore. You don't want to pay us and you're going to increase the rent on where we live? Fuck that noise. They saw something that was fundamentally wrong, fundamentally immoral, fundamentally not on the side of the American working class. And they looked at that shit and they were like, we're out, we're done. This is not how we're playing the game. We tried to talk to you. You said we're not even real. You question. You don't pay. You don't treat us well, and then and then you you challenge our reality. You challenge the realness of our humanity. Fuck that shit. <clears throat> we ain't gonna play no. We ain't gonna play that game, son. One hundred and twenty-five thousand workers. This is in eighteen ninety-four. Pre-internet. Pre-Twitter. Pre-email lists. They just fucking. Boom, we're done. We're done skis. Uh, now, of course, these, com- these, these railroad companies across the country that were seeing these wildcat strikes happen, uh, we're not just going to take that sleeping. They're not just going to take that laying down. So they fought back. And they brought strike breakers in. Scabs is usually what they're called, strike breakers is what they what they're officially referred to as um and these were all black people these were all black men that were that were being brought in as strike breakers and that was um this kind of complicated things a little bit you know because um first of all i'm i'm sure a lot of these you know black workers in 1894 who 30 years ago were not allowed to be a part of the workforce to begin with, um, are not trying to get barred out of a specific industry, right? Like, what if they join these these strikers? And then all of a sudden, in, you know, 1895 rolls around, and uh, all of the railroad companies go, hey, uh, we're not hiring any more black people because they fucking strike, they, they stood with that union and that we said wasn't real. Uh, and they said that they were, and you know, it's like, Hey, we kind of gave you like three fifths of a personhood and you should like not get in the way of that. Uh, so we're going to take like the rest of that away from you. Like, you know, like that's basically what they were afraid would, would happen. And you know, Congress would stand by that. Congress would be like, yeah, you guys just do whatever you want. You guys are great. You guys are doing so good. Look at your suit. Huh? You want a shovel business? I got a shovel business that I'm not doing anything with, you know. So they were they were nervous about it, and and the bosses essentially exploited that fear. That's what they did. Um, the you know Pullman and other railroad com- companies at that time, 
they exploited that fear. They basically saw the fear and the, the concerns that the black community had, and they played into it. And this is, again, this is a corporate strategy that you still see today. Um, they, they, they leverage that fear against the worker. They leverage that fear to, to try to use your identity to kind of divide us a little bit more. Um, and so what are you supposed to do, right? If, if it, in this specific case, how do you kind of maneuver around that? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to maneuver around that. So Eugene Debs uh, basically said, we're going to host a, a peaceful meeting um, and, and, and just talk through this. We're going to talk through what our rights are. Well, eventually mob rule took over uh, after, this, after this peaceful meeting and uh, shit started getting violent. And uh, as this is sort of happening, on the western side of the country, uh, there was a ton of sympathy strikes. The Western states were having a ton of sympathy strikes uh, on their railroads as well. So obviously the movement was building. You know, things were getting bigger. This was, this, this was looking like it might head towards a, a, a large general strike. So there was a federal injunction put into place. And uh, Debs was like, oh, remember how you said we're not real? Um, we don't have to listen to your injunction if we're not real. So he ignored it. He was just like, uh, your, your real laws don't work with imaginary people. And he just fucking, you know. Uh, so uh, Grover Cleveland, who was the Republican president at the time, uh, used the army to enforce this injunction. Uh, once again, right? We're, this guy's basically like, yo, I'm civil disobedience, I'm peaceful. Um, I'm, I'm trying to rectify these people that got violent. I'm trying not to get them to do that again. Uh, there's a bunch of other peaceful demonstrations happening all across the country. Um, and what's the response to that? The response to that is, ah, but we're, we're, we say you're going to be violent because maybe, I don't know. So we're going to be violent towards, that's what I do. I get violent. You know what I mean? As the president of the United States, you know, whenever I whenever I meet a force that disagrees with me, my my first uh, thought is, how can I kill it? Not let me talk to it, you know, to ask Mexico. They were like, hey, we disagree with you on this being your land. And we were like, oh, yeah, well, I got a whole army. And they were like, wait a minute, what's happening? And then. Everybody died, and I won the argument. So ask me if I've ever lost a debate. You can't, because anybody that's tried to debate me, I set their house on fire. That's how I win debates. Because you know what you can't debate against? Arson. And then I say that you burned your own house down, and what are they going to say? They're homeless. They're crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's great. Like, that's how... The, that's the United States mentality right there. They called in the army when the dude was like, I'm going to be peaceful and just try to talk this shit out. Uh, I don't see your injunction as real because you're, you're not going to, I mean, are you going to say that I'm a real union? That means that the railroad company has to negotiate with me now, <laughs> right? So as this injunction goes out, Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union call for a general strike and they look for support from some of the more larger more established unions right like the AFL the American Federation of Labor which was a lot more established at the time and uh and all the other unions were like eh, nah bro we don't want to this is not what we want to do we don't really want to take your side for some reason um which is very confusing to me like when I read that I was like really confused about it um and, and we're seeing that today, too. You know, we, we do have certain union groups that are looking at the wildcat strikes that, that are going on today in our society. Um, and they're looking at it and, and saying, well, we don't really agree that this is the right time to do it when this is absolutely 100% the right time to do it. Um, because any time that a strike even happens, it's the right time to fucking do a strike. And if you're a union, you should fucking be on their side. If you're a member of a union, you should be on their side. You should have sympathy strikes. You should have solidarity strikes. Um, 
But the AFL was like, nah, we're not going to support Debs, right? And as a result, uh, the army used the force. They, they used their own force to break up a lot of the strikes that were happening across the country. Um, so there was a bunch of organized strikes and the army went in and used force and used violence uh, to, to essentially break the strikes up, which is very unfortunate to see. Um, and as the violence escalated, because once the army pushed back on them, the strikers pushed back on the army, uh, 30 strikers got killed, 57 were injured, and $80 million in property damage was done. $80 million. That's what they lost, right? That's what the elites end up losing in all this. They end up losing money. But the strikers and the workers end up losing their lives, and these people, these, these fucking elites will sit there and say that our dollar sign is worth more than the lives of these other people. You can just make up more money. That's what you do. You make up more money. You can't just bring a human life back. You can't bring that one specific human life back. And that's, that, and that's how they think. So, um, there's a Methodist preacher named uh, J.W. Jennings, um, and he points out, uh, he points this out. Let me see if I can find that screen capture. First, he says uh, that the party leaders were pliant tools of the codfish moneyed aristocracy who seek to dominate this country. I mean, you could, you could say that that's still true today, that these corporations only care about their bottom line. They only care about their money. You know, they don't care about safety of their of their consumers or their employees. If you if if they did, then Amazon would have immediately oh, somebody got tested positive with this virus, this pandemic that we're in. Yeah, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna shut the warehouse down, we're gonna give everybody paid uh, paid sick leave for two weeks and we're gonna fucking just redo the whole facility. Every other business that I have seen is like, hey, there's a pandemic. We're working on limited hours with limited employees. Uh, we're all working from home. So things are kind of different. So be patient, you know, but not Amazon. They're like, no, we want, you know what we're going to do? We're going to send you your package within 38 seconds of you clicking that button. And if it's not, then we, you get to punch one of our workers. How about that? Is that good? Are you guys happy? Are you guys... And, and then we'll actually give you, you can give us $5 to punch a second worker too. You guys good? That's pretty good. That's pretty solid. That's a great business plan. That's what they do. They care more about their, their moneyed interests than they do the people. That's how it works. He also goes on to say uh, that rather than defending the rights of the people against the aggression and uh, uh, against the aggression and oppressive corporations. That's what the government has chosen to do. That, that President Cleveland, this dude got fucking elected twice, man. People elected this fucking guy twice. They were like, this guy's a good president. This guy's great. He really likes murdering average people. That, that's what we like to see in a president. <laughs> they were just like, well, we'll... We'll bring it back at some point. He defended the corporation. And again, we see that again, right? 2008, who got bailed out? Banks. 2020, who got bailed out? Banks. We're all fucking stuck here. So what did the public support look like for this strike? Um, wasn't great. They were, uh, they were swayed more by the, the media and the rich. And the rich were running a propaganda campaign to essentially make, um, make these strikers and make the American Railway Union look bad. And one of the ways that they did it is by making them look greedy. They were, they were, they were making Eugene Debs, who was going to bat for the American worker, for unskilled workers, right? The quote unquote unskilled workers, which I, I don't even like that term. Um, they, they were like, this guy's trying to fucking turn a buck. That's what he's trying to do. 
It's like, what? You own where these people live, man. <laughs> and you own where they work. You own every piece of their life. And now you're trying to take more of their wealth and you have the audacity to call the person fighting on their behalf greedy. Fucking crazy. And then the public was just like, yeah, it seems right. It seems right that this fucking gazillionaire is... Nobody's thought about... Nobody's thought about this guy, you know. Have, have they thought about his millions of forks that he needs to own? The fuck? Like, like that... And that still happens today. That's how they... That's how they push back against unions. That's how they push back against these strikers. You have assholes like Ben Shapiro on his show screaming about hazard pay and how you should just do it for the glory of work. That's not how your fucking system works. Your precious capitalism. I mean, it is. Your precious capitalism is based on greed and doesn't give a shit about people. But aren't you supposed to get paid for what you do? Under capitalism? Isn't that how it fucking is supposed to work out? That's how they fucking make this work. They make they make the strikers who are asking for uh, a better work condition, safer work conditions, and to be paid appropriately. They make them look greedy. Jeff Bezos has $165 billion. Bill and Melinda Gates are fucking multi-billionaires. You think Tim Cook from Apple isn't fucking super rich? The guys that own Instacart, Lyft, Uber, these people are fucking billionaires. But they're not greedy. They're not greedy. For wanting more by cutting, you know, employees... Pay, putting them in dangerous conditions. They're not greedy. It's the people that actually want to be con- treated like human beings. How dare you? <laughs> That's how the public in 1894 was conned into not being on the side of the worker. And that's the same tactic that they use, what, over, over 120 years later? So what happened to Eugene Debs? Uh, Eugene Debs, um, they they charged him with a bunch of stuff, including conspiracy. And that one didn't particularly stick um, because his lawyers, I think Clarence Darrow, um, who was like a super famous lawyer at the time, um, he basically said, well, he had public meetings. Like he was talking, he was making public speeches. So where was his conspiracy at? You know, like he was advocating for the worker publicly. Everybody knew where he stood. It was the corporations. It was the rail companies that were acting in secret that conspired against their workers. They didn't have public meetings to say that they were going to increase the rent and cut the wages. They went in secret to the president. Uh, So the conspiracy charge was dropped. But they did, um, they kind of gave him like treasonous charges and stuff uh, because he went against that federal injunction. And, uh, and he was put in prison for six months. Uh, so in 1895, he was put in prison for six months. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day so make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that i put out there uh and uh and if you if you have the means to uh please consider making a a donation i know we are all in tough times but if you if you can uh you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, While you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming 
and uh, downloading websites, if that's that's if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.